Where did life go? Every day I find myself asking this same question of the mirror. Yet the answer always eludes me. All I see is a stranger staring back. Everything aches these days. My legs, my hands, my eyes. My wrists and fingers throb from a lifetime of hammering the keyboard. My desk is old and the chair creaks. Every so often the old wood-burning stove coughs smoke back into the room. One window is cracked and soon I will need to find someone to fix the roof. The whole place needs a lot of work. But I'm too ancient for all that now. The building and its contents will outlast me. The old word processor still functions, though. There's power in the both of us. There is electricity. And while it's still there, I've something to share. I was a young man once. So young and green. And that can never change. Memory allows me to be so again. The bay opened out before me. A great glacial basin carved by creaking ice and trickling water hundreds of thousands of years ago. I approached it from the north and saw a giant semi-amphitheatre that held within it farms and hamlets as the land funnelled downwards to an opaline sea. There perched a huddled cluster of houses in a cleft in the land. Between them and the water, a narrow sweep of glittering bronze sand. The houses sat above the ebbing tide on a crumbling cliff face of loose soil and wet clay that was slowly being eroded by the salt spray and circling fret, stranded sailors shipwrecked by the storms of centuries. Time itself was chipping away at this coastal reach. The sun was a brilliant disk of shimmering white and I stopped to refill my flask from a spring that fed into a stone trough. The fresh water slid down my throat like cords of silk. There'd been a war, and though the conflict was over, it still raged on in those men and women who'd brought it home with them. The world felt as if it were full of holes, scarred and shattered. I was a child when the war began, and a young man when it ended. In its wake, visible loss was everywhere, hanging like a great heavy cloud over the island, and no amount of red, white and blue bunting or medals pinned to the chests of its survivors could change that. Yet it had awakened within me a sense of adventure, a wanderlust, to step beyond the end of the street to where the flagstones finally gave themselves to the fields, and industrial northern England stretched away beneath the first warm haze of a coming season of growth. I was sixteen, and free and hungry, hungry for food, as we all were, yet my appetite was for more than the merely edible. To those blessed with the gift of living, it seemed as if the present moment was an empty vessel waiting to be filled with experience. War had taught us that time was a limited resource, and to spend it wastefully was as great a sin as any. Life was out there, ready and waiting to be eaten in greedy gulps. I'd set out in spring, a pack on my back containing the bare essentials for a journey whose only aim was transience. A sleeping bag, a blanket and ground sheet, a change of clothes, two camping pans, my flask, penknife, fork, spoon and plate, a trowel for outdoor business, no map, I had no need for a razor either. On the morning of my departure, my mum also insisted on squeezing into my bag a pack-up containing some thick slices of ham, cheese, apples and a large stotty, all wrapped in a face cloth that she made me promise upon God's good name that I would use at least once a day. There was still a nip in the air when I left the ancient city, joining the river below the high turrets of the great cathedral. I let the slow-moving waterway guide me as I followed it upstream through a wooded gorge, then beyond and out into the great unknown. Whenever possible, I kept to the woods and glades, fields and dales. I found work where I went, at farms and on small holdings. Many families had lost men or had seen them return depleted, decrepit and broken, 
parts of them missing like second-hand jigsaw puzzles. These homes always needed young brawn to do the tasks that their broken men could no longer complete, and few doors I knocked on turned me away. I steadily laboured across to where Durham met Cumbria, and Cumbria shook hands with North Yorkshire, where the mining of tin and lead were still the local industries, or else the farming of sheep took place on windswept slopes of the upper moors all year round. The woolly back creatures corralled and clipped in the summer and dug out of drifts in the long lingering winters. It was a different landscape to the one I was accustomed to. The empty vastness of the moors, a whispering place, free of the clang and clatter of colliery life. A place weighted with myth. It was thrilling. I became my own master and at each turned corner slithered further free from my adolescent skin. Food was gifted. I existed mainly on eggs and potatoes and last autumn's apples and would on occasion be given milk for my flask or some fresh balls of butter wrapped in a hessian twist. I was given greens too, sometimes a turnip. Once I received a jar of honey into which I found I could dip almost anything. Even a cube of turnip speared on my fork end became an edible delicacy if I shut my eyes and crunched through to its bitter centre. As the distance from everything I'd ever known increased, I began to feel a sense of lightness about myself. For the first time I was out of the shadow of the creaking, clanking minehead and away from the dark grey dust that seemed to settle everywhere. My parents had never even entertained the idea that I might do anything else but join the pit. The expectation that I would follow my father down the shafts, as he had his father before him, was the very reason I was walking the lanes of England now. Yet the ties of the community were still pulled tight enough to make me wonder whether this was merely a short-term reprieve, a first and last hurrah before the dire prospect of knuckling down. I had to at least try to see another world before cold took me over entirely. In time... I felt the lure of the sea, so I turned towards Europe, following the road signs that led down through villages that clung to Cleveland and North Yorkshire's eastern edge. Skinning Grove and Loftus, Staithes and Hinderwell. I went to Runswick Bay, Sands End, and then finally entered the town of Whitby with its whalebone archway and vinegar breeze, and across the bay I saw the skeleton of an old abbey perched in silhouette. Twice along this stretch of coast I passed planes that had been shot down. One a blackened abstraction of flame-twisted metal, its glass melted away. The second I found sitting in a cornfield with one wing missing, but otherwise intact. There on the tail and the remaining wing were the insignias of an empire of horror, and scattered around it a contorted propeller blade and a ragged piece of cloth that I did not dare to pick up. It felt as if the bomber had come down only minutes earlier in a spiralling descent over the checkerboard fields of a foreign land, smoke trailing, death rising up to greet its hurriedly praying pilot. I did not linger here, and soon I peaked the hill of High Normanby and looked down across the grazing slopes of Filingthorpe, and below it, the bay, its waters a beautiful mosaic of emerald and malachite. Down winding lanes I walked, the sea almost mirage-like in the mind of a young man whose only maritime experience had been a yawning childhood morning spent watching the choppy grey waters slapping at the stone docks of the shipyards of Sunderland. Even then my impression of the sea had not been of the water itself, but that which fed off it and into it, a world of rivets and sparks, of fire and noise. Yet here only... Sixty or seventy miles further south ran tiny arterial waterways as clear as glass. They sang sweetly on their way to meet the lambent salt water of a North Sea that sparkled as if its surface was made entirely from a million strong shoal of freshly spawned herring. Here the ocean was a gateway, an open invitation, and I accepted it readily. I took a narrow lane, then crossed a shallow ford by ancient stepping stones where time was notched on cold rock by hobnailed feet following an ancient network of paths. Deep in the cool, dark throat of one such route, 
I saw a badger set burrowed into the dirt bankside and surrounded by mounded heaps of impacted soil. These sculpted slopes led into winding chambers embellished with freshly scratched claw marks. I paused for a moment, aware that I was more than likely close to a family. Asleep in their earthen bunkers, the outside world muted. I noted the location, then crawled beneath a fence to cross an open field. I soon met another track and turned left onto it, even though it had the appearance of leading to a dead end. Something drew me down that lane. This was to become one of those moments when life presents a new path whose importance may only be fully understood in years to come. A hundred yards on, the lane narrowed into a rough track and I came upon a cottage. It was built of local stone and covered by a Virginia creeper whose tangled vines reached tentacle-like around corners, leaves fluttering in succession when a light breeze ran across it. I could see a garden that held a small terrace of cracked paving stones, a lawn and a vegetable patch trimmed with herbaceous borders, all contained by a crooked wooden fence whose bubbled white paintwork had been blistered, chipped and sanded away by the salty air. The garden was a small, semi-colonised corner of a wild downhill sloping meadow that directed the eye to the sea a mile or so away, framed by the hedges and trees on either side. Several bird tables were busy with a variety of tits and finches, robins, chiff chaps and black caps, and I watched them for a moment, silent and unseen, until three circling crows descended, their shadows crossing the sun. I noticed that beneath the overhanging eaves of a red brick outbuilding that adjoined the house were two nests of clay and feather, the homes of wrens in residence, shaped like thrown bowls fresh from a potter's wheel. It was then that I heard a snarling, a low growl like an engine turning over. I looked over my shoulder to see a large German shepherd, poised like a sprinter awaiting the starter's gun, its alert ears pinned back and tail pointed like a wireless antenna. His seeking eyes were fixed on the prize, my wrist. I did not move. This brutish-looking hound stared, the wet flesh of his top lip peeling back to show his elongated incisors and the brilliant pink and black marbling of his gums and palate. He growled again, a low curdle, meaty thunder. Butters! said a voice, as a woman straightened to full length from the thick meadow scrub beyond the garden fence. She turned towards the dog and then to me. Oh, she said, there you are. The lady was tall, edging six feet, her posture defiant and proud, which only made her appear taller. Her face was angular and her jaw strong, her mouth appeared wide and feline in its slight upturning at the edges. It suggested a smile suppressed, and I could not accurately have guessed at her age, for the young always judge anyone over forty to be old, but there was a lightness to the way she moved towards me seemingly untroubled by either the weight of ageing or the threat of a sweating stranger. Get by, Butters, she said. And at this the dog lowered himself to the ground and rested his head on his paws, but with his eyes still trained on me. He's all mouth and no trousers, she continued. I call him Butler, Butters for short, though of course Butters is in fact a longer word. I just came down the lane. I said by way of a clumsy explanation. Yes, I expect you did, she said, and from somewhere far beyond it, judging by your accent, which, if I'm not mistaken, has something of the pitmatic twang about it. I did not then know that pitmatic was the name given to the dialect of those who lived in the colliery villages of the northeast, nor that I even had an accent at all. Well, anyway, she continued, you're just in time for tea. Will you have some? 
If my accent was that of an outsider, then this lady's was not one I was used to hearing either, and more like that of someone you might only ever hear on the wireless. I managed to muster a response. If it's not any trouble. She shrugged. It's no trouble for me, so long as you fetch the nettles. Nettles? We're having nettle tea, do you take it? I hesitated. I always thought nettles were poisonous. Poisonous? Of course not. They might sting, but that comes only from the tiny hairs on the leaves and stems. When boiled, they soon become ineffective. She paused. I found it's as good a quencher as any, and you look like you're spitting feathers. I am rather thirsty, missus. Well then, but you're not to call me missus. She stepped towards me and extended a gloved hand. If you must call me anything, call me by my name, Dulcie. Dulcie Piper. Right, I said, feeling my face flushed. Now is when you tell me your name. I forced an awkward smile and took her hand. It's Robert Miss... At this she tutted and wagged a long finger. And what's your family name, Robert? It's Appleyard. Well, now, listen, Robert, while I explain the procedure for the perfect brew of nettles. Simply take a generous fistful of this most maligned of all the indigenous weeds and boil it in a pot of aqua vitae. Then, once mashed, add three squeezes of lemon until the tea turns a peony pink in colour. Serve in a tin mess cup or fine Ming china, it matters not. Embarrassment prevented me from admitting that I had neither seen nor tasted a lemon and didn't fully understand what she was on about. "'I know what you're thinking,' the old woman continued. "'How does one acquire lemons in a land bereft? "'Let's just say I have connections. "'One needs a little flavour in life, even if it is illusory. "'Nettle tea's a rather dull drink made tolerable by lemon.' "'Don't you get stung?' I asked. "'Picking the nettles, I mean. "'Not if you have the right technique.' Use a finger and thumb to grasp the leaf with confidence and you'll be all right. But seeing as you don't yet have the technique... She took off the well-worn pair of gardening gloves and tossed them to me. Try these. I'll get the water on. We drank our tea looking out into the meadow beyond. I got a better look at the garden a small area in otherwise wild surroundings, the meadow encroaching on this landscaped space in which Dulcie had built a small rockery and installed beds that were just starting to show the first shoots of flowers. Now then, she said, blowing on her cup, a pot of tea for your story seems a fair trade. On your way down bay, as the locals say, are you? Yes, I, I think so. In the distance, I could just make out the line of the North Sea, tantalisingly obscured from view behind a chaotic meadow of grosses and hawthorns, weeds and thicket. They're a rum bunch down there, Dulcie nodded towards the sea. Some are descended from smugglers. They've lived too long at sea. It sent them funny. She took a sip and sniffed the air. I merely stared blankly back at her. I saw a woman in odd flowing clothes that were either extremely old-fashioned or the height of modern fashion. I was unequipped to judge either way. Even the swirling colours of the scarf she wore and her billowing trousers, trousers, seemed to be taken from a different palette. And some of the old sea dogs sup like fish. You should see them, bellies like ale barrels. It's a wonder they can see anything when the garden needs watering. When I realised what she meant, I blushed and then smiled. Still, no harm in them, no harm in them at all. No doubt some of them think I'm an ageing, ungodly slattern, or Satan himself, but they can go whistle. Do you not believe in God, then? She made a noise in response. <laughs> no, I'm of the opinion that religion is nothing but end of the pure hocus-pocus. Shocked by this confident and intimidating lady, I felt myself flailing. I was out of my conversational depth. She was quite unlike my mother or most older women I knew. I was used to a subdued and unquestioning reverence towards religion, especially from the elderly. Are you a believer? she asked. I thought about this for a moment. Well, I went to a Church of England school. 
Dulcie smiled. You strike me as someone who's spent as much time looking out of the window as you did at the textbook page. I was probably looking at the pit where my dad works and his dad before him. He's a miner. Digging out the dusky diamonds, as they say. What about you? Will you follow your forefathers underground? I don't know, I said. I thought I'd take a wander first. She laughed. Oh, I like that. That shows spirit. You should stay for tea. Proper tea, I mean. It's very kind of you, I said, but, but this is more than enough. I should really push on. The dog appeared by Dulcie's side and she scratched behind his ears. I'm doing lobster, she said. Not that I'm attempting to keep you captive. Do you partake? Well, I've not had lobster before, no. Dulcie looked mock aghast. Never? Me mum's not big on fish. Sensing, perhaps, that my restricted diet was as much down to economics as availability, Dulcie was discreet. Well, God knows this wall's made us all tighten our belts, she said. We might have our freedom, but a tin of pilchard still seems like a luxury. It's those Germans, I said quietly. They should all rot for what they've done. You should see some of the men in the village. And that's just the ones that made it back. I'd slit the throat of any kraut me. It would be me duty as an Englishman. Dulcie studied me for a moment. I can understand your hatred completely, she said. But, Robert, you should not be bitter or angry about it. War is war. It's started by the few and fought by the many. And everybody loses in the end. There's no glory in bloodshed and bullet holes. I also happen to know that Germany's been left in a terrible state too. And always remember that most of those young men, boys, the same age as you are now, no doubt, didn't want to be there either. Don't hate the Germans. Many of them are just like you and me. I couldn't see how this could possibly be true. I'd grown from a boy to a young man, knowing few certainties in life, that the Germans were surely a monstrous breed was one of them. I just find that hard to believe. We're all just people, Robert. Some are brave and some are foolish, and almost all are scared. We're confused, lonely and flawed, but a, a fine, fresh lobster lifted from the briny depth is perfection, and I'm now going to insist that you stay on for an hour or so. Then after you've fed, you can sail to the fatherland with a dagger between your teeth, if you so wish. Besides, Butler here is a German shepherd, and he's the most loyal friend an old sturgeon like me could wish for. I must have a thing for Teutons. At this, the dog stepped forward and sniffed at my knuckles. I patted his warm, noble head. Oh, th thank you, I said. Thank you, I, I will stay for tea. You can thank me, said Dulcie, by fetching a good clump of garlic from down the meadow. She stood and straightened her sun hat. Butters will show you where to find it. I followed the dog beyond the garden fence and into the overgrown field. He pushed on, impervious to the burrs that stuck to his fur, and flattened a path to the bosky patch where there were dozens of bouquets of wild garlic, sprouting like leafy fountains from the soil. Down in this shaded corner, I could see neither the sea nor Dulcie's cottage, which, with the creeper crawling across its façade, already gave the impression of being pulled down into the Yorkshire sandstone. Held in the clutches of this hollow, I had the impression of the meadow being entirely sealed off from the world. I felt as if I were experiencing the wildlife around me to a heightened and intense degree, and not only experiencing it, but becoming a part of it, immersed in such a way that I could hear the rustle of every crawling ant, or the scratching of each fly's dry wing, or the chewing of a masticating wasp on a rotten piece of timber hidden from view. Breathing deeply, I smelled the sod, the garlic, herbs and airborne pollen, and the tang of the salted sea air, too. The tiniest details came into sharp focus. The skeletal architecture of a small, dead leaf that had lain untouched since winter, or the quiver of a solitary blade of wild grass where others beside it were still. The quiet panting of the dog, too, fell into the rhythm of my own heart as it beat a gentle pattern of sweet, coursing blood in my eardrums. 
A single drop of sweat ran down my left temple. I felt alive. Gloriously, deliriously alive. For what felt like hours, but may in fact have only been a few seconds, time appeared static. The moment frozen, until I finally stood and, dizzy from sensation, took a narrow trail deeper downhill through the thickening grass. It led between some brambles and brought me to a rotten gate that hung from one rusted hinge. I pushed through it and found myself at the edge of a much flatter farmed field that looked right out across the descending land. Here, finally, was the sea, in its full unobstructed aspect. The dog stood alongside, and I let time and landscape wash around me. The hum of insects and the coda of nearby birdsong, the closing soundtrack to an afternoon reverie of such power and potency that my whole life was, perhaps, imperceptibly nudged in a different direction. Walking back from the field, I saw, tucked away in the top corner of the meadow, adjacent to Dulcie's house and secreted beneath an overhang of branches, a sunken structure, which, like the cottage, gave the impression of being pulled under. I pushed through the grass towards what was a shack, an old summer house perhaps, constructed from creosote-coated wood, now unevenly shaped from years of sun, salt, fret and neglect, but nevertheless standing soundly on a raised base of solid stone. The steeply arched, corrugated roof was stained cobalt from decades of rain, and the ornately rendered white window frames, though weathered, had all their glass in place. I tried the door. It was held shut by the encroachment of wildlife from the meadow, I attempted to shoulder it open, but the warped wood had jammed it in the frame. So instead I cut my hands around my eyes and saw inside a place of dust and darkness. There was an old bedspring frame in there and a dresser. I saw a rattan chair with oversized holes picked through it as if gnawed at by rodents. There was a standing lamp with neither shade nor bulb and many stubbed thumbs of melted candles were stuck to the interior window sills, their wax drippings hanging pendulously. There were curled sheets of paper discarded in the corner, a couple of empty wine bottles and dust, dust everywhere. Dulcie called me then, and Butler the dog appeared a moment later by my side to guide me back to the house, like a discreet but attentive valet. Mindful of disturbing an established hierarchy, I let him lead the way. Dulcie was gesturing from the kitchen window, a veil of steam bellowing up from the pot, noisily roiling away behind her. She pushed the window open wider. Come in and look at these beautiful beasts, she said. I walked around to the side door and stepped into the kitchen. It was small, like the galley of a ship, with pots and pans hanging everywhere and was dominated by an old scorched range. From the ceiling hung a paraffin lamp, on which Dulcie, a good three inches taller than me, almost certainly must have hit her head with regularity. "'Have you been down to the beer and back already?' I asked. "'Sorry, I, I mean down beer. <laughs> Not likely. Barton brings them up, twice a week. He leaves a couple in the water trough out on the lane. Fish, too. Haddock, place, skate.' Whatever the catch can spare. I live off the stuff. Puts pep in your step. Good for the brain, too. Look. I bent over the boiling pot and saw two lobsters, like craggy creatures, lifted from prehistoric times, turning a darkening umber colour in the bubbling pan. They're huge, I said. Actually, they're small, but the smaller ones have the sweeter meat. 
The bigger ones are older and don't always taste as pure. Their flesh has turned cynical. Dulcie crouched and opened the range door and threw in two logs, which she prodded into place with a poker, then closed it again. Who's Barton? I asked. A fisherman. He lives up the hill. Nice chap. He gives the impression of being taciturn, but I think he's just more at ease on the water than he is on land. Now, garlic? Dulcie put out her hand, and I passed the garlic to her. She quickly trimmed away the leaves and sliced the roots down to the bare bulbs. These she skinned and diced, and then she placed a small pan on the hob. Does he bring you the logs too? Heavens, no. She nodded out across the back garden to where I noticed for the first time a sawhorse and chopping block. It keeps me trimble, she said. Trim and nimble. They always say logs warm you up three times, chopping them, carrying them and burning them. From her pantry in the corner she brought out an enormous butter dish from which she cut a knob the size of a small bar of soap and dropped it into the pan. That piece alone constituted more than the two ounces per week that I knew the rationing book allowed. We'll have white. Can you get me a bottle? Dulcie nodded towards the pantry. It was cool in there. I saw stacked in a rack at least two, maybe three dozen bottles of wine. There were other bottles too, containing spirits I'd never tasted. Whiskey, cognac, gin, plus cherry brandy and ones labelled with words I'd never seen. Grappa, schnapps, metaxa. From floor to ceiling the shelves were packed with tins of meat and fish and beans and soup, bags of flour, sugar and rice and packets of biscuits and bars of chocolate. There were two large dried sausages and jars of preserves. Some of the labels appeared to be in German. There were boxes containing exotic-looking delicacies such as figs and dates and Turkish delight, bottles of fruit cordial and two small wheels of cheese wrapped in green leaves. Surrounded by all this produce, I felt overwhelmed, disjointed somehow, as if I'd stepped into a picture or a painting. Back at home there was the butcher, the greengrocer and so on, but even the general store had the same unchanging supply of ration food. Tinned English hams, baked beans, sweaty government cheese and patties of lard that looked like engine grease. Having never tasted wine, I had no idea which to select, so picked a bottle of white at random. I passed the bottle to Dulcie and she glanced at the label as she stirred the liquefying butter and scraped the garlic in. Good choice. Will you open it? The corkscrew's in the drawer. I found the implement and fumbled with it. Wedging it between my knees, I managed to uncork my first bottle of wine without breaking the cork or spilling it down myself. Dulcie took it from me, splashed a dash into the butter and then took a larger swig directly from the bottle. She smacked her lips. You know, Robert, I've got so used to dining with just butler watching that I've forgotten my manners. Forgive me. Glasses too, please. She poured the wine and then we clinked drinks. I took a large mouthful and swallowed it down quickly. There was a sharpness, followed by a warm sensation that spread through my gullet and deep down into my stomach. It was the first liquid I'd tasted that appeared dry, though the feeling was not completely disagreeable. I took another swig and felt the wine in my veins as a pleasant ache. Dulcie lifted the large pot and poured away the water. These lobs are done, she said. With tongs she lifted them onto plates and passed them to me. We'll eat al fresco. Great, I said, not moving. Lovely. Outside? Oh, right. Dulcie followed me with a small bowl of the garlic butter and another containing the chopped leaves. There was a board with half a loaf on it already there. As I sat stiff and straight at the table, Dulcie passed me a nutcracker. I'll show you how, she said, pushing up her sleeves. She took a claw and twisted it away from the body of the lobster, which was now deep burnt orange in colour, steam plumes rising from the fissures where its limbs joined its body. She then gently but deftly pulled back the smaller jaw of the pincer until it broke away, 
revealing a crescent of pure white flesh. She dipped this twice in the garlic butter and then tipped it to her mouth, pulling the meat from the shell. Then she folded a piece of bread into her mouth and ate it, chewing noisily and making a sound of satisfaction. Mm -mm, food of the gods, she said through a mouthful. Dig in, Robert. I followed her lead and managed to extract the warm flesh from the lobster. I dipped it into the melted butter that was the colour of egg yolk and just as creamy, then held the piece of lobster in my mouth. I didn't even have to chew. It collapsed into a soft paste with only the faintest hint of the sea behind it. Never had I tasted anything fresher. The kippers that my mam reluctantly fried for my dad on a Friday night were old, leathery things in comparison. Like the inner sole of a pitman's boot, the scent of the smokehouse lingering all weekend long. The wine, she said. You haven't touched your wine. I took another sip and let it wash around my mouth. It was still too tart for my liking, but the salted aftertaste of the butter seemed to take the sharp edge off it. We ate more bread and garlic butter and finished off a rough salad. So, said Dulcie, you're here to see the sea. Yes, back at home the sea turns grey with coal dust, but down here it's different and, and the sand looks much cleaner too. My father had taken me to the shipyards of Sunderland on a rare day out, fifteen miles and two long hours by a bus whose upper deck swirled with the blue smoke of players and capstans. We'd pulled crabs from the drab water of the harbour using string lines baited with fatty knuckles of ham saved from the butcher's drain. The smell of petroleum and the crabs' luminescent green shells had been enough to put us off eating them and we tipped the bucketful back into the oily water. Now, only sixty or seventy miles further south, down a coast which I'd wandered for many weeks, the shipyards and coke-blackened waters of Weirmouth felt far behind me. Dulcie poured more wine, and we sat in silence. The evening had drained into night as we had drained the bottle of wine and it was too late to continue down bay, where there would be nowhere but doorways and ginnels in which to sleep, or the beach where the incoming tide would take a sleeping man away. Night settled upon the meadow, like a trawler's net sinking slowly to the deeper waters, the sun fading as the gloom enfolded everything within it. So, at the top end of the meadow, I pegged my tarp into a triangular shape and crawled in with my sleeping bag and a small flask of tea dashed with a tot of whisky that Dulcie had insisted I bring with me. She'd also offered butler's services as a night watchman, but I'd declined. I didn't fear the dark. In fact, I relished it. It was a clear, crisp night and it had cooled considerably as I lay watching the sky run the gamut of blues. My head swimming from the wine, and my stomach bloated and creaking from the rich food after several weeks of dining on scavenged basics. An elongated prism of light stretched from an upper window of Dulcie's cottage across the garden, but soon that went out, and all was perfect darkness. I tuned into the changing soundtrack as nocturnal species turned the meadow into an arena of feeding, flying, calling and crawling. The dipping shadow shapes of bats clicked as they swooped in irregular circles. Field mice carved the tiniest tunnelled runs through the grass. I heard an owl hoot and followed the sound of its call for several minutes before I saw its shape on the branch. And then... Fleetingly, its wide, unblinking eyes, like two moons crossed by a passing streak of threadbare cloud. The whisky tea went untouched. The night alone had me drunk enough. In time, it took me entirely.
When I awoke, Butler was standing at the entrance to my improvised bivouac. His head was cocked an inch or two to one side and his eyebrows arched. Having never owned one, I'd never much noticed the behaviour of dogs before. Round our streets, they roamed freely, scavenging from bins and doing their best to avoid getting flattened by coal trucks. But I was already beginning to recognise the signs with which Dulcie's dog communicated. Hello, butler, I said. Good morning, dog. I scratched behind his ears and he responded by nudging my hand and half turning away and then repeating the action. I understood. I was being summoned. Though the morning air had a cool edge to it, the outside table was already laid with the remains of yesterday's loaf, plus pots of jam, honey and butter, and more nettle tea turning pink in the pot. Dulcie sat with a hardback book, obscuring her face. Good morning, I said. She lowered the book. And how did you sleep? Well, I said very heavily. Dulcie poured my tea and I joined her at the table where we ate and drank in silence, occasionally swatting away the wasps that had begun to pay visits to the jam pot. I had a look at that shed yesterday, I said, when we'd finished. The one hour in the meadow there? She said nothing, but stood and started stacking the cups and teapot onto a tray. It's in a bit of a state, I said, but structurally it still seems sound. She frowned. Well, I've no use for it now. There must be something I can do about the place before I go, I said. How about I tackle some of them weeds? It'll only take me a couple of hours to hack them back and then I'll be on me way. I've not eaten so well in weeks and every other meal has been payment for work. A good meal isn't payment, said Dulcie, tipping the crusts and crumbs under the table for Butler. It's a God-given right for all men and women. But if it makes you feel worthy, you can spend an hour with the scythe for all the use it'll do. There are tools in the lean-to round the side of the house. You'll find what you need. She turned and took the tray into the kitchen. The sickle was as blunt as a fish knife, but in the lean-to I found a sharpening stone, which I used to strike a smooth edge back to the half-circle of steel. Swinging the blade as hard as I could, I worked my way along the line of the fence. Within minutes I was sweating. Stooping low and then lifting the tool above my head was putting a strain on my back, so I returned to the lean-to and rooted around. Right at the back there was a pair of long-handled shears, so old that the pivoted fulcrum had rusted into place. I looked for oil but couldn't find any. I walked round to the side door and tentatively knocked. When there was no answer I pushed the door ajar and called for Dulcie. A head peered round the top of the stairway. Yes, what is it? Sorry, I said, suddenly feeling like an intruder. I, I just wondered if you had any oil. I, I, I need some for the tools. Only cooking oil? That should do it. There's plenty in the pantry. Help yourself. She disappeared again. On my way out, I saw through into the small sitting room that was dominated by a huge country dresser. There was a fireplace and a chair, and stacked everywhere there were piles of books and papers. On the mantelpiece there was a photograph of a young woman. Dulcie, perhaps? Another showed two women, but they were too far away for their features to be distinguishable, and I didn't want to pry. I oiled the bolt on the shears and set to work again, snipping away at the grass, weeds and nettles. The morning sun rolled slowly across the sky, as delicate music floated out over the meadow from the open windows of the cottage. A playful piano melody loudly introduced a plummy, slightly effeminate voice singing about Germans. Dulcie appeared in the garden and waved. This one's for you, Noel Coward, she shouted. He's a friend of mine. It's a small satire about showing compassion to our supposed sworn enemies. I thought it apropos to our conversation last night. Do you know it? Don't let's be beastly to the Germans. I walked closer and listened. No, I, I don't think so. That's because the BBC banned it from the airwaves. We'd be ruled by Nazis now if the Germans had their way, I said. 
Dulcie shook her head. Worse, Robert, much worse. We would be ruled by those remaining English stiffs employed by the Nazis to do their bidding. Chinless wonders and lick spittles. There'd be no room for the poets or the peacocks, the artists or the queens. A legion of middle managers would be the dreary midwives of England's downfall. Human turds, the lot of them. Dulcie looked adrift for a moment. Then she shook her head and smiled. Are you familiar with the other popular song? Hitler has only got one... what's it? I smiled too, and I shook my head. Oh, yes, you are, said Dulcie. You know, one ball. I laughed. Yeah, we used to sing it in the playground. Well, I happen to have it on good authority that there's a certain truth in it. Cryptorchidism, an undescended testicle. She paused and scratched her chin. On the right side, I believe. But how could you possibly know that? I was told by a very credible, highly trusted source, and that's all I can say on the matter. She leaned forward and tapped her nose. The walls have ears. Now, how are you getting on with the jungle? It's going to take a little longer than I expected. I thought I'd just finish the fence line and then trim back some of the scrub down at the bottom so that you can see the sea again. Why would I want to do that? She said. Don't you want to enjoy the full view? She frowned. Not especially. I've no great love for the sea these days. Yet you live so close to it. Let's just say we had a falling out and leave it at that. But how can you fall out with the sea? Because you just can, she said more sternly than I expected. We fell silent. Look, I refuse to be at the mercy of the sea's changing whims, Robert. That's all. I just won't do it. The sea's petulant and tempestuous, and I've no patience for its daily dramas. It doesn't interest me. No, it's fine. I won't trim the scrub if you don't want me to, Dulcie. A moment passed. She sighed. I know you're just trying to help. Forgive me, Robert. It's just that the, the sea has done me few favours over time. You shouldn't let my cynicism sigh your experience, though. I decided not to press the issue. I was thinking of taking a quick walk before I finish up, I said. Do you think Butler would like to come? Why don't you ask him? Dulcie turned. Butters, would you like to go for a walk? At this, the dog's ears pricked up and tilted. He gave a small whine of anticipation and his tongue lolled. I'd say that's a yes, wouldn't you? Any lingering wisps of morning cloud had cleared as I climbed the back fence into a series of fields sloping up towards the skyline. Butler vaulted the fence and darted ahead. I thought I might investigate the Badger's Lane that had inadvertently delivered me to Dulcie's house. Heading uphill and inland, the fields led to the Holloway that I'd walked in on. Here I smelled something strong and searched the ground for a sign. There it was, a pocked patch of holes where the soil was at its softest, and in each was a stool, the colour of anthracite, with a sheen as if preserved beneath a shining lacquer, the badger's latrine. Behind it, an impenetrable nettle patch provided good cover for the badger's set. I stooped to the entrance of one of the holes and looked down into the cool portal that wound away beneath a tangle of overhanging roots, a helter-skelter slide down into another world. Badgers were nearby, docile and dormant. I could feel their presence, as they no doubt could sense the proximity of an imposter crossing the single beam of light that penetrated their ancient anti-bunkers. I inhaled the smell of damp soil, of unseen England. I worked all afternoon, hacking away at more of the stubborn weeds, pausing only to drink great gulps of iced water flavoured with sugar and lemon which Dulcie brought out for me. High afternoon became low skulking evening. The dull strain of exertion ached in my back. 
shoulders and neck. I walked slowly through the meadow back to the cottage. I was aware of my joints and my skin felt stretched tight from the glare of the sun. An evening dip in the sea was all I could think of, and then perhaps some fish and chips, and an early night in amongst a cliff-top thicket or in a rocky cove, with a good fire going and a nettle tea for company. I had a taste for it now. Dulcie was standing in the garden in a wide-brimmed hat, a silent silhouette, with the sun behind her and a glass in each hand. Cocktail time, she said. The drink was light red in colour and there were cubes of apple floating in it, and ice and strawberries too. I took a sip and it fizzed with new flavours in my mouth, sweet and sharp. Oh, that's smashing. What's in it? Bit of everything in the cupboard and then some? I chewed on an ice cube. I thought I'd just finish off the last bit of the trimming, tidy up, then I should probably get going. What, now? Well, soon, yeah. Aren't you exhausted after all that labour? Dulcie nodded to the basket slung over one arm. I've just been to get tea. Oh, there's really no need. She studied my face for a moment. I'm not going through this ridiculous rigmarole again, as earnest as your intentions may be. Well, I thought maybe fish and chips, I said. Then you thought correctly, because that's precisely what we're having. Oh, you're being too kind. It's a bit of fish and some chipped potatoes, Robert. And one can never be too kind, unless, of course, you're desperate to flee the grip of this old crone. In which case, flee, flee to the horizon. I won't be remotely offended. Nor will Butler, who will find his dog bowl rather full tonight. Though it does seem he's rather taken to you, haven't you? She looked around. Where's that beast got to? Searching for the dog, Dulcie removed her hat, which was as large as a sombrero, dabbed at her brow with a handkerchief, and then replaced it. I'll batter it. Well, the dog? Dulcie snorted, whooping with laughter. The fish! The fish, you stiff plum! I have a John Dory that's as long as my arm. Barton brought it up. I took another big swig of the drink. Look, said Dulcie, let me put a fish in you. Then you can be on your way. An army marches on its belly, and though you're a sole soldier gone rogue, you still need refuelling. The horizon awaits. Eat, and then go to greet it. Remind me how old you are again, Robert. Between us, Dulcie and I had drunk another cocktail and the better part of another bottle of white wine. I'm 16, I said. Dulcie's eyes widened. I knew you were young, but 16? She emptied the last of the wine into her glass, then took a drink. Do you have any inclination as to what you might do with your life beyond this Homeric voyage? I'm not entirely sure, I shrugged. I expect me dad'll try to set us on soon enough. What with his father and his father's father gunned down the pit. Have you considered higher education? What, like university? Exactly like university. I scratched the dog behind his ears and took more wine. People like me don't go to places like that. What do you mean by people like me? Cool folk. But you've got a working organ in your brain pan, haven't you? She said. That's all you need. I smiled. And the rest. You need the right clothes and the right way of talking, for starters. Dulcie tutted. Complete nonsense. All you need is an appetite to learn. And if it matches your appetite for food, I imagine there's no shortage. How did you get on with school? I'd rather have been outside. 
And do you read much? Sometimes, I replied, with not many books in our house. My dear boy, luckily for you, you've pitched up at the right place. Here, wait a minute. I'll see what I can find. Dulcie stood and went into the house. She reappeared with an armful of books and tipped them onto the table. You've heard of Chatterley, I expect? Yes, I said. And then, realising that there was no point pretending, I said more quietly, I mean, no. Well, you really must read Lawrence. In fact, I shall keep you hostage until you do. I think a young man like you with blood in his veins might take to him. Though you'd be hard pushed to get an unexpurgated copy like mine. She held the book out to me. I read The Spine, Lady Chatterley's Lover. It's as rare as rocking horse dung, that edition, thoroughly banned. I opened the book. In blue ink it was inscribed to Dulcie. She rifled through the other books. Now, nah, what else? Well, Whitman, Leaves of Grass, of course, for an American perspective. There's Shelley, John Clare, and I can't give you works entirely by men, can I? So we must also turn to Emily Dickinson, Christina Rossetti, and for a bit of Northern Gritstone, Emily Bronte, too. The Heathcliff story is worth a dabble, though it needs a good editor. She pushed a small pile towards me. Have what you want. Thank you. I'll look after them. Take them. Take them, said Dulcie. It's good to have a purgation. It was a close evening and the sky was starting to moil. Clouds clustered and tumbled, eating themselves. The warmth of early had grown into a damp, cloying heat. I stood and stepped up onto my chair to get a better view of the sea, where a foreshadowing curtain was being drawn across the water. Between the low scudding rain clouds and the sea, there was a mottled movement, a shifting shape like a swarm of insects, but which was, in fact, columns of sea-borne rain, coalescing and then separating again, as they blew in on the cooler winds of the northern continent. It was as if the sea itself were being sucked up skywards. They call it the offing, said Dulcie quietly. She gestured down the meadow. That distant stretch of sea where sky and water merge. It's called the offing. I climbed down from my chair. I didn't know that. The sky rumbled. The dog's ears pricked up, tuned to the changing atmosphere. The first full drops of rain fell then. Dulcie said, Might as well uncork another bottle and watch the show. By early morning the storm had abated. The sun rose lazily over the meadow, pale and wan at first, but then gaining in strength. Breakfast was light, a boiled egg and an apple each, plus nettle tea. Soon I'd rolled away my blankets and tarpaulin and had my kit bag ready. I bent down, scratched behind the dog's large ears one more time. Thank you for feeding me, I said to Dulcie. It's beautiful here. Distractedly, she watched a butterfly alight upon a leaf. I'll stop by again if you're passing. Butters would love to see you again, I'm sure. The dog looked up at me. Oh, I nearly forgot. She went into the cottage and then returned with a small brown paper package. What is it? A dried sausage, or rather a string of them. German. They call them Landjäger. They keep for months. Cast your preconceptions aside and enjoy something to nibble on. I thought it might change your mind about our Teutonic cousins. Where did you get them from? Dulcie didn't reply. Instead, she simply said, Goodbye, Robert, and walked into the house. I was left standing in a silence that seemed to hang heavy with things unsaid and was perhaps beneath it all tinged with the faintest streak of regret. The dog followed me to the end of the lane, and then he too turned back. Above the bay, grand houses looked out, as the sun threw copper shards across the silk sheet of the sea. Further on, there was a postal office, a general store, and a row of guest houses, each with a vacancy sign in its window. 
I caught glimpses into neat parlours where everything was polished, buffed and ordered. As the road dropped downwards, I descended into a huddled cluster of streets of old fishermen's cottages, much smaller than the opulent Victorian places up top. With barely a straight line in sight, they were so close that their inhabitants could reach across from one dim living room to another. It was a cobbled, disorientating place of slick steps that led down to gloomy cellars and secret passages once used for smuggling. I was, as they say, down bay. I counted three snug pubs before the road ended abruptly at a stone slipway from which the fishing boats were launched daily and then hauled back up upon their return. On the beach below, the tide had deposited large tangled banks of seaweed, gluey and bubbling. Limpets and barnacles clung decoratively to the wet rocks. Fleshy red anemones too. So beautiful when submerged and in full bloom, but deflated and melancholy looking gelatinous blobs when stranded at low tide. The sea was an hourglass, tipped and then tipped again with each turning tide. Overhead a gull shrieked a greeting. I stripped to my shorts and ran down to the water, hurling myself into the sea to cool my skin and finally enjoy the first fully submerged wash in weeks. The seabed was a jagged morass of pebbles and smashed shells swirling round my ankles. The water made my bones feel forged, indestructible, and as the brown brine turned to a fizzing foam, a large wave took me by surprise. Though I turned my back to it at the last moment, it walloped my neck, defiantly slapped my face, filled one ear to deafness and sent me stumbling into the icy squall. I pushed off and let the North Sea take my weight, my feet kicking a dark void as I swam out, each wave rising through me, lifting me up, the force of the moon exerting itself as the land disappeared from view between each undulation, everything on it obscured. I felt deliriously alive. At the slipway, a fisherman was tending to a knotted coil of blue rope as thick as my wrist. Beside him were a stack of creels and four baskets containing the best of that morning's haul. That'd not catch me in there, he said, rolling up the sleeves of his gansey as I passed. I smiled. It's not so bad once you're in. Refreshing. He sniffed. Fishermen don't swim. Why not? Most can't. Still, there's worse days for it, I suppose. He stooped and lifted from his basket half a dozen mackerel. Here you are for the old dear. For... for Dulce. For a moment I was confused as to how he knew who I was. You are the lad that's been stopping up there. Aye, but, well, you'll save me the bother if you can fetch them back with you. He pointed to the pots at his feet. I said I'd send something her way, but I've got errands to run and these creels to fix. You must be Mr Barton, I said. He nodded. Aye. Your lobster was smashing. Give it a month, when they've fattened up and we're in full season, then you'll know what smashing is. That's what Dulcie said, but I'll be long gone by then. Barton looked at me sideways, then held out the fish for me in a manner that was almost aggressive, a taunt of sorts, a challenge. The mackerel were close to my face, the flanks glistening. They smelled of nothing. Here you are then, lad. Well, the thing is, I'm actually heading off now. Off, said Barton, slightly affronted. Where to? I nodded down the coast. South. Well. What's so bloody good down there? I don't know. I, th I thought I'd find out. The fish were still held close to my face. I looked into the ruined mirrors of their pupils and saw the deep green and magnesium striped pattern of their lean, muscular flanks. Their bellies the colour of molten lead. A hint of obscene pink within the gills. Their metallic sheen. It'll not take you long, he said. What's an hour or two out the rest of your life? All right. I took the fish from him. He seemed to soften then. She's a fine cook, is Dulcie. 
Some folk down bay call her nutty, but she's just her own lady, that's all. Lives the life she wants to lead. Did she never marry? I asked. Barton crouched and locked the straps on his basket. You'd have to ask her. And even then she'd only tell you what she wanted to tell you. He stood again. You'd best get their mackerel up there and into the pantry. The day's warming nicely. He lifted a basket and hauled it over one shoulder. How did you know I was me, Mr Barton? He looked away. He squinted out to sea. Just did. Dulcie did not seem surprised to see me return to her cottage. Her tone, though, I noted was curt. Your hair is wet. Why? I've had a dip. In the sea? Yeah, it was freezing. Of course it was. It's the sea. It's a terrible risk. I was quite safe. No one is safe in the sea. It's prone to cruelty. Trust me. And you brought me those, have you? Yet Mr Barton asked me to deliver them to you. But all the way from down there, what did his last slave die of? I shrugged. And what about your voyage south? Well, he was quite insistent. Well, I'll not eat all these myself, she said, even with butler's help, so you'll have to stay for tea, I suppose. Oh, no, I said, though I was once again famished. I'll stuff them with fresh fennel and spinach, said Dulcie. I looked down to the bay, to the sea, and to Ravenscar beyond. What's fennel? I asked. Right, you're staying. Butler will be delighted. I was back again. We finished our supper of fresh mackerel and Dulcie sat back, her hand on Butler's head. Did you find somewhere to kip tonight? She asked. Not yet. We'll take the shack again if you like. It's grubby, but I imagine it's better than bivvying out under canvas. What was it used for originally, I said? The shack? Dulcie fed some bread to the dog. It was a studio. A studio? Are you an artist? Oh, no, not me. A writer? No, I've not been stricken with that curse either. It looks like it could do with patching up, I said. A lick of paint? Did you build it? Yes, well, no, not with my own hands. I helped design it. For a few moments, the only sound was the dog chewing his bread. I was suddenly aware of the silence and stillness of Dulcie's overgrown home, and not just how tranquil it was, but how isolated it might be too. Only then did I feel the faintest glimmer of the loneliness that she perhaps experienced deep down inside. Before I knew it, I was blurting out a suggestion. I could fix it up for you if you like. Whatever for? Well, I just thought it needs protecting before the damp gets into it entirely. Well, let the damp have it. The cottage is enough for me. Well, even so, I said, it's still a good cabin. It'll only take a day or two at the most. One to clean it out and undercoat it, the second for another lair. Well, look, Robert, if you want to waste your time on it, I won't object. There's plenty of paint in the lean too. Use that. Brushes too. Use what you can find. And then, when it's done, I said, you'll be on your way. Yes. Dulcie's crooked smile turned into a full beam as she raised her glass. Then it looks like we have a deal. I rose at first light. There was no sign of Dulcie when I began to clear out the shack. Moving first the pieces of furniture out into the meadow and then the empty bottles, lampshades and broken picture frames. Next followed two ashtrays and a pallet of paints, each coloured cube cracked and arid like desert earth. There was a cardboard box containing newspapers from the early 1930s, plus a string-tied stack of photographs, theatre programmes and other printed items. 
I began to thumb through them and saw ticket stubs, party invitations and scribbled pages torn from notepads. But as I rifled through, I felt a pang of voyeuristic guilt. Here were lives into which I had not been entirely invited. I continued for a moment longer, then stopped and hurriedly replaced them. Beside the stack was a small brown briefcase. Its locks turned turquoise with decay. I prized them open. Inside was a file containing a typed manuscript also tied, but this time with the pink ribbon commonly used for legal documents. It was thin in my hand. Placed on top of the manuscript was a curious item that I lifted out. It was made from a number of drab rags, each tied to a circle made from a wooden rod, hazel perhaps, and bound and tightly lagged with further strips of cloth. A string was attached to the circular frame, so that it might be suspended. In amongst the ragged strands was a handmade rosette, and dangling through the centre of it was a pair of white elbow-length gloves, the palms clasped together by a single stitch, as if in prayer. The item was strange and inexplicable, and it unnerved me, so I gently laid it aside. As I did so, the morning sun beamed into the studio, dazzling me for a moment. I turned my back to it, and untied the knotted pink string of the manuscript. On the front, in typed letters, it said, The Offing, by Romy Landau. Curious, I held it for a moment, and then replaced it. An hour or so later, I walked down to the bay and bought from an ironmonger some fresh paintbrushes, white spirit, varnish, nails and various other things that I required. The shopkeeper's eyes followed me around the store. But when I presented the money Dulcie had given me to pay her monthly bill, her face brightened and she tallied up my items. You're the lad from North Country I heard about, she said. Yes, I expect so. Relative of Dulcie's, are you? No. Feeling slightly protective, I didn't care to elaborate until I knew the purpose of this woman's questioning. She looked at my supplies. The handyman, then? I suppose so, in a way. Bit of company will be nice for her. Must be lonely up on that hillside after everything she's been through. Well, she has a dog, I said. She shook her head. Scant consolation. Terrible, terrible business. Yes, I said, before asking. What was it that happened exactly? Well, that's Miss Piper's business, she said, passing me the bag. She'll no doubt let you know if and when you need to know. Certainly not my place to start flapping my tongue to every passing tradesman. I could tell that the shopkeeper wanted to say more, or at least wanted me to inquire further so that she could take some small, sadistic pleasure in refusing me again. But instead I thanked her, then turned and left to slowly walk home. Though I was curious, I had no desire to be drawn into the complex web woven by people like that. Instead I bought some crab sticks, and slowly chewed them as I climbed the steep track out of the village. They were like pieces of rubber in a tube that had been dredged from the ocean floor. I took a longer, looping route back via a small church that I'd seen far across the fields from Dulcie's Hollow. It sat at the crossroads of three back roads, and as I approached it, I saw that its cemetery, a walled-off sloping patch of hillside, was inhabited by a dozen rare-breed sheep, their shorn coats as dark as coke dust. They raised their heads in unison for a moment and then collectively continued to chew at the grass around the burial plots as I climbed a stile to walk amongst the graves. The headstones were quite unlike any I'd seen. Several were carved to represent different aspects of nautical life, knotted ropes, anchors and leaping fish all featured, and the epitaphs told of lives lost to storms, Several of them, I noted, were mariners drowned on the same day. Many featured the same few family names. The weathered slabs of North Yorkshire stone faced out to the sea that had taken many of these lives and were in fact mere memorial markers for bodies never found. The church itself was a small box of sandstone with a tiny bell tower no taller than a chimney stack. In the top corner of the portico, was built a swallow's nest of mud and grass, for 
from which there came the insistent call of chicks, and when I climbed up onto the bench to gain a better look, I was met by four upturned heads with their beaks open so wide I could see the thin pink membranes of their throats. I pushed at the grainy oak door and stepped into the church's shadowed interior. It was cool and still and perfumed with the scent of centuries. Dust, polish, old worn cushions, leather, wet coats, candle wax and oil. I passed a table laid with dead flowers, a visitor's book and a donation box, and walked down the central aisle. The church was narrow, but the bowed ceiling was like an upturned schooner, much higher than it appeared from the outside. My boots echoed up to the old curved beams overhead. Only then did I see that I was not alone, for at the back of the church, hunched over at the far end of the penultimate row, was a woman, her head bowed and her shoulders silently shaking. If she had seen me enter, and she can hardly have failed to, she did not acknowledge me, and I suddenly felt like an intruder upon her grief. I turned to leave, and as I did I saw, hanging from the ceiling, several of the very same mobile-like creations that I'd found in the suitcase in the shack. These ones appeared to be made from older cloth trimmings, and hung suspended on twine from the ceiling beams like jellyfish in the deepest offshore waters. As I passed the woman, I saw that she was not old, and had in her lap the folded cap of a soldier. Overcome with loss, she didn't look up as I lifted the latch on the door and carefully closed it behind me. That night in the shack I was stirred awake by a truffling sound close by. Very slowly I sat upright and peered over the window sill to see a badger not more than ten feet away, rooting at the soft soil. It was large and grey and had its back turned to me, stooped, in such a way that I thought of the war widow I'd seen weeping in the stillness of the evening. The big old badger's coat was coarse, and the creature so close I could gain a measure of its long claws as it scraped at the soil amongst the fronds of early summer bracken. It slowly ambled away, nose to the ground, oblivious to my rapt presence. Again, I felt a guilty sense of voyeurism, but immense luck, too, at being privy to this moonlit moment of solitude. The encounter left me exhilarated, wide awake, sleep now an impossibility. So I lit the lamp and lifted the manuscript that I'd found in the briefcase again. I turned to the title page and read the table of contents. On the next page, its dedication read, For Dulcie, Spinner of Honey. I read a poem entitled Exeunt, or White Horses, and when I finished it, I read it again. Though I felt like a trespasser of sorts, and there were words and images in it that I did not understand, the poem awoke unfamiliar sensations within me, more than anything an overwhelmingly powerful sense of place, this place in the here and now, as if the words had crept across the paper and fallen off the page to gather all around me like vines. The next poem was called Unmothering. I read that too. I read them all. And then when I finished I went back to the beginning and read them all again. There was still much that I did not understand, Yet the lines were clear and brought to life a world I recognised. Here were images that I knew, of places that I'd recently experienced, and the choice of words was almost incantatory in its effect. These were works written right here, where I sat, in this very shack. A world alive with sea fog swirling around the meadow, and birds' nests and badgers skulking through the pre-dawn murk. Each read like a message folded into a bottle and cast away on the tide of time directly to me. I returned the papers to the briefcase and lay back down on my sleeping bag as the waking sun painted long fingers of light across the ceiling of the shack. And it was as if a switch had been flicked inside me. The feeling was not now that of exhilaration, but unease. Whoever Romy Landau was... Her work was both haunting and haunted, heavy with images of foreboding. Death stalked the pages. Of that I was certain.
I worked on the shack all the next day. First of all, I set about removing the front door and then reattaching it so that it was airtight. I replaced a window latch that had come loose and adjusted the taps in the tiny bathroom, which, aside from a pattern of mould that covered part of one wall, was otherwise fine. Late in the morning, Dulcie pushed through the long grass carrying a tray of sandwiches. I'll leave these here for you. Thank you, I said. Do you want to see what I've done? Not especially. I trust your judgement, Robert. She seemed reluctant to enter the shack, whose contents were scattered about in the grass. She cast her eyes across them now. I bit into my sandwich and chewed a mouthful of egg and cress. Well, I'll leave you to it, she said. But I haven't shown you what I've found. Found? Yes. I wiped my hands on my trousers and reached for the briefcase, then pulled out the manuscript of poems. I, I don't have my spectacles, I'm afraid, said Dulcie. And I have a million things to do. She turned away. It it's a collection of poems, I said. Dedicated to you, it it's called... I know, she said, the offing. She looked at me for a moment, and I saw for the first time something in her face I'd not yet seen. Something desperate, contained behind a rigid facade. And you've read some of it? she asked, her voice strained. A little, I lied. I, I hope you don't mind. Why would I? It's not my work. Still, would, would you like to see them? I held the manuscript out. See them, Robert? I practically lived them. I don't need to read them. There was also this. I held up the item made for Braggs. I wondered what it was. Dulcie didn't take it. Instead, she half turned towards the meadows, towards the sea. If you really must know, it's called a maiden's garland. It's symbolic. What does it symbolise? There was a long pause. Purity. They're made for funerals. They're placed on the heads of those who are purported to have died chaste. Chaste? Pure. Allegedly virginal. They're for those who've died before their time. Hamlet's poor Ophelia wore one when she was found in her watery grave, put there by her own volition. Here she's allowed her virgin crants, her maiden strumments. Crants is another word for the garland. A silence fell upon us, and I was suddenly aware that the shack was a room built for one. Its dimensions encouraged a physical closeness that, in this moment, felt awkward. Why do you have one, Dulcie? Because I do. I hesitated. Is it anything to do with these poems? She held her hand out. I passed her the file and the maiden's garland. Everything, she said. One has everything to do with the other. She opened the file and glanced at the first page and then flapped it shut again. I noticed that her eyes were wet. Not once have I cried in front of anyone, she said. Not once, even at the funeral, did I come close until now, that is. The file dangled in her hand. Well, I suppose now is as good or as bad a time as any. For what? For me to explain everything? I tried to speak. I tried to say something honest and wise and compassionate. But perhaps I was too young to fully possess any of these attributes. Instead, my face reddened. You don't have to. I tried again. What, what, what I mean is... Too late, said Dulcie. The floodgates are creaking under the strain. One thing, though... Yes. We're going to need a gallon of tea, and I believe it's your turn. Finish your sandwiches first, then come up to the house. Her name, said Dulcie, meant obstinate or rebellious. Romy. We met in London. She was a poet, fast becoming brilliant even then. Not in her writing, she was still an undergraduate finding her way, but the way in which she lived her life, unrestrained and not at all in possession of the vinegary disposition of German stereotyping. 
Her existence itself was poetic. Her clothes, her humour, her laughter, the way she held herself. And let me tell you the pursuit of bohemian individualism in 1933 was not encouraged. We were in Dulcie's living room. I was sitting in an armchair, but she preferred to stand. Anyway, so, the writing was on the wall, written in bold yellow stars. A person of her nature couldn't be expected to stay in a country ruled by thugs and propped up by acolytes. So Romy packed her bags, wrote her way out, actually, a scholarship. She could have gone to Oxbridge, but claimed that she couldn't find it on the map, so plumped for our fair capital instead, which is where I met her. She was a magnet for many, but none felt the pull stronger than me. You and her, I said. She was a great deal younger than me, but then Romy was a great deal of everything to everyone. Faster, funnier, gayer, and with a rapier wit. She just had to find a way to express herself. And with some gentle steering from yours untruly, that outlet, it transpired, was poetry. What you have to understand, Robert, is that Romy's mind ran at 200 miles an hour all the time. But she would have these most awful mental and physical collapses, where she'd not be able to leave her room for days. Then she was a spent husk, an empty shell. Dulcie seemed to be searching her memory for the correct words. My father had kept this place as a bolt hole for eons, so we began to spend time here. I had the studio especially built for her, the perfect refuge. It was a place in which she would write, with a beautiful view of the meadow and down to the bay, clean air, fresh food, and in Romy's case, daily swims out there. Claimed it helped refresh her mind, and certainly it seemed to work wonders. In these moments she looked lit up. I nodded. Dulcie continued. And so she wrote the bulk of her first collection in this house, which I edited, and of course it went on to be a huge success. Romy was very much in demand, and we visited most of the major European cities, where she gave readings and charmed the press everywhere she went. Dulcie crossed the room and lifted a small framed picture from the wall. She passed it to me. It held a photograph of a young woman who was more beautiful than I'd imagined. Her chin was tilted slightly upwards in a challenging pose, and her skin appeared to glow. Her lips were slightly parted to show her teeth, and even though the picture was monochromatic, I could see that she had brilliant blue eyes that were at odds with the colour of her hair, which was worn quite short and as black as Whitby Jet. She looks very nice, I said too embarrassed to express my true feelings. Like someone famous, a film star. Dulcie took the picture from me and stole only the briefest of glances at it. What was our book called? I asked. The Emerald Chandelier, Dulcie said, returning the frame to the wall. So, back and forth, we went from sea to city for engagements and readings... For a brief and brilliant moment, she was the new literary darling. But all the while, things were deteriorating back home. In London? No, 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 in the motherland, or rather the fatherland, Germany, where her work was not in print. Nationalism was approaching fever pitch, and the tide had rapidly turned against all things Germanic here. Romy had barely drawn breath before she found herself rejected on both sides. Her readers retreated, the publishers fell silent. Her creative fire, once raging so ferociously, had been dampened by nationalistic fervour and ignorant twat. She was stymied. She sounds like a very talented person, I said. She was, said Dulcie. She was very special. She fell silent. In my naivety, it was only then that I realised that perhaps the maiden's garland had belonged to Romy, or been used to mark her passing. Dulcie's tears were not for a broken relationship, but a lost life, a tragedy unspoken. I, I can see that it must have been a nice place in which to work before it became overgrown, I said. Dulcie's face had darkened again. Perhaps it was she said quietly. Perhaps. 
but impending war is difficult to ignore, and loss of one's nerve even more so. She looked around. And now I'm rather tired, perhaps a nap. Yeah, of course. You might like to take Butler for a wander later, after you've finished whatever it is you're doing. I'd be glad to. I took Butler up onto the moors for a two-hour walk and returned exhausted. There was no sign of Dulcie and her curtains were drawn. So I lit a lamp and took out the manuscript that she'd insisted I return to the studio. Something compelled me to read the poems again. I think it was the desperate look I'd seen in Dulcie's eyes and her words that had gone unspoken. The truth of her friend Romy's life was to be found in this stack of papers that had, for years, been touched only by spiders. Sitting there, the oil lamp's flame casting writhing shadows across the pale pages, I felt as if the poem's author was in the cabin with me. It became clear in my untrained, barely read mind that as I progressed through the collection, each poem was arranged in such a way that Romy Landau was writing towards her own escape, her own expiration. There were laments for herself, exit spells. It was the middle of the night when I finished the collection and finally discerned what had happened to Romy. The answer had been there all along, in Dulcie's hatred and mistrust of the sea and in the maiden's garland. Yet it was only when I read the collection for the third, fourth or fifth time that I, a young man more readily used to wandering the lanes or dreaming what great adventures might lie ahead, finally understood. It was one poem in particular that revealed the truth of the matter. The poem that now most commonly features in anthologies has been read on radio and set to music and even chiselled into a memorial stone that sits deep in the heart of a wood near the Germany-Austria border but which, back then, was still just a poem secreted away from the world and read only by me, the humble son of a hard-working miner. Exeunt, or white horses. I leave this land and give myself to golden water. How deep, I wonder, do the sun's tresses trail? How far the reach of the wretched figure on the wretched beach and what awaits she who rides white horses, then slips to swaying darkness down coralline chains to fingerling roots and briny beds, where bestial wails chorus like carillon chimes, where all is rust and shadow and salt-stripped bone, a snuffed-out sun, a retreating shore, a perfect undertow taking her home. A perfect undertow taking her home. Romy Landau had drowned herself. Work on the studio continued each day for a week, and then too. I patched up the shack and with each small task created a greater problem to be solved. A new window pane, two new window panes, a drain to unblock, a cracked ceramic pipe to unearth and fix. When I wasn't working, I was fed increasingly lavish meals by Dulcie. Then when the tide and the weather allowed, I walked down bay to enjoy a swim most evenings. And each night, in the creaking shack in the meadow, I slowly read by lamplight the books that she'd given me, confused and bored by some, but inspired and energised by others. Full summer had arrived, and I felt my body changing. So lean and pale when I left my home, it was now filling out, seeking a new shape. Cords of narrow muscle ran through my arms, and the soft puppy flesh of waist and stomach was hardening from all the stretching and swimming. I felt different, stronger and more capable. It was a strength that seemed to come from within. I saw the world in a sharper focus too. The bay was becoming busier. 
I watched as each day the summer brought people and the people brought buckets and spades and sandwiches wrapped in paper and hard-boiled eggs and warm bottles of pop. The rock pools became subjects of forensic examination for excitable barefoot boys from the industrial towns of Teesside and West Yorkshire. While mothers arranged packed lunches on blankets, dogs coughed up salt water and irritable fathers slept beneath their handkerchiefs. Those who had made it back from the war, anyway. Everyone was glad to be alive, and no one said so. Just to feel the damp sand between their toes was enough. And there were girls, too, young ladies around my age, in bathing suits and headscarves, and in bloom. Each day I saw them scattered around the beach, some paddling in shallows in pairs, shrieking at the cold North Sea, others reclining to smoke cigarettes alone, with attitude. They occupied that no-man's land between adolescence and adulthood, where different masks are tried on for size. I was too stunned by their physical form and considered poised to do much about my infatuations, beyond attempting to offer a shy smile that often to my horror came out as an awkward grimace. A withering look from one could crush the soul and destroy a day, yet the suggestion of a smile might make me dizzy for hours afterwards. Something unfamiliar stirred within me. Young manhood, like a benevolent parasite, had taken residence and was slowly altering me from the inside, and I was merely a passive host as complex chemicals steered me through the summer. There was little I could do about it. A strange alchemy was underway. There would be no turning back. Have you written to your mother? Dulcie called to me one afternoon when I was attempting to sharpen the shears again. Won't she be worried? With a tinge of guilt, I realised that the thought hadn't crossed my mind. I'm sure she's fine. She'll be dead busy. And I'm sure she won't sleep properly until she's at least had a scribbled line from you. Do you think... I frowned. I have excellent stationery, said Dulcie. You may use it. That night, by the light of the lamp, with the dog stretched out beside me on my blankets, I put aside my book and sat back to write a note to my mother. Dear Mum, I hope you and Dad are both keeping well. I am writing to you from a shed in a meadow above a bay in Yorkshire. It is dry and warm, and I'm quite well. The shed belongs to a lady called Dulcie, who I've been doing some odd jobs for. She's taller than any man I've known, except perhaps Big Jack Barkley, though unlike Big Jackie, she still has her front teeth and doesn't eat worms. She reminds me of a very long cat, and she's not like anyone from the village or anywhere. The weather is beautiful here, as I hope it is there. I plan on coming home when the exam results are announced, though I can't quite remember when that is. So if I'm not back in time, perhaps you might send them on. I will forward an address if and when I have one. Warmest wishes, Robert. P.S. Dulcie has a dog called Butler, because he acts like one. He's sitting beside me now. He is the second new friend I've made this summer. One day soon afterwards, over a lunch of sorrel omelettes with salad, Dulcie asked, Have you read The White Horses One, then? It took me a moment to realise that she was continuing the conversation about Romy's poems that had ended abruptly over a fortnight earlier. Yes, I said. So you know by now what fate befell her? She fixed me with a stern look. Or you should. You're a bright boy. I hesitated. Did Romy drown herself? Is that what you think happened? I hesitated again. I think that's what White Horses is about. She frowned. Then you're correct. I'm sorry. Really, I am. And what did you think of the poem? It was the saddest thing I've ever read. But I reached for the words. In a strange way, it was beautiful too. Dulcie nodded for a long time. She is in the offing now. We finished our omelettes in silence. Have you read the collection, Dulcie? 
I asked when our plates were clear. You didn't actually say that you had. She left it behind, Dulcie said, right there in that studio of hers. She put it on the desk and then she walked down the hill and into the sea. One poem was set aside, White Horses. A week later I read it, but then I put it all away in an old briefcase and there it has sat ever since. So, no, I have not read the collection. Did she mean to kill herself? Even just saying the words felt awkward, as if I'd broken a code of silence. Kill herself. I immediately regretted asking the question. What felt like a long time passed. She intended to become immortal, Dulcie finally said. But to do that one must die. And to die like that, one must walk away from all that one knows and loves. So... White Horses was Romy's last goodbye before she drowned herself. As I said, you're a bright boy. I swatted a fly away that was repeatedly trying to land on my arm. Did she leave a note? She shook her head. Nope. Or if she did, it was well hidden. Believe me, I searched. No goodbye. Nothing. Can I ask you something else? You don't need to ask me if you can ask something. Just skip that bit in future, Robert. Why does Romy call you the spinner of honey? She looked across the meadow. Because at that time I had a passion for beekeeping. Amongst other things, one spins the comb to extract the honey in liquid form. So Honey Spinner became her name for me, or one of them, anyway. We sat in silence for quite some time. Finally, I asked, have you ever thought about getting the offing published? Dulcie sighed, but said nothing. Perhaps it's, it's too painful for you to read. She turned and snapped at me then. Your problem is you're too astute for one so humble. I'm sorry, I, I don't know a thing about poetry. But weren't you tempted to read the collection, though, Dulcie? Every single day. But you never have. Why? Dulcie sighed again. Are you afraid of ghosts? She asked. I shook my head. I, I don't believe in them. No, that's not what I asked. We're all of us afraid of being confronted by our past selves in the small hours of the night, she said. That's what ghosts are. We carry within us our own ghosts with which we haunt ourselves. That's all I'll say on the matter. There was another silence. Then Dulcie's face suddenly brightened and her tone changed entirely. Listen, I've had a tremendous idea. All this gloomy chat's getting to me, so why not let's crank up one of the engines and go for a Sunday drive? W what do you mean by one of the engines? Well, a motor car one, of course. Well, you have a car. I have several. Wait here a minute. She disappeared inside and returned with a large bunch of keys. Let's take the Citroen. It's in the barn up the hill. With Butler and an oversized hamper strapped in the back, Dulcie drove us extremely slowly up the steep single road that led inland, away from the bay. We'll head for the moors while I get my bearings, she said, hunched over the wheel as she tried various switches and levers. Now, my eyes would shame a myopic mole, so what I want you to do, Robert, is shout out if you see me drifting across the road. Shout loudly. As we crested a steep peak in the road, without warning, Dulcie suddenly accelerated. The knack is back, she shouted over the roar of the engine and the wind. She accelerated again. I think I should like to see the moors in full summer bloom. The road levelled out and took us through miles of moorland billowing in all directions, and we dipped and bounced over undulations and potholes. The dog stuck his head out of the window, his tongue and ears flapping. This is a Citroën Traction Avant, Dulcie shouted, which translates as front-wheel drive. Though in France they call it Reine de la Route, Queen of the Road. I rather like that. How old is it? It was one of the first models off the production line, 1934. Romy helped me pick it out. The road forked, and at the very last moment Dulcie jerked the car to the right, 
and all the contents that weren't strapped down slid in the opposite direction. Signs flashed by. Kirby Misperton, a mother bee, Scagglethorpe, Brawby. We skirted the town of Malton, and then a few minutes later Dulcie finally slowed and took a right turn onto a long, straight road that ran into the heart of a great private country estate. We passed beneath the arches of an ornate gatehouse, onto a drive that led to the biggest house I'd ever seen, a beautiful, sprawling palace of stone, with a huge domed roof and wings running off to either side, and acre upon acre of green lawns leading down to a lake. Well now, said Dulcie, not a bad little pile. Where are we? Castle Howard, domicile of the Howard family since 1699, though of course it is rather ostentatious to call it a castle, when it is in fact merely a very large stately house. Do people live here? Certainly. Dulcie pulled off the road and steered us down onto the vast lawn. She turned off the engine, and when the car rolled to a stop, she got out. Butler jumped out beside her. Fine spot for a snack, I'd say. I climbed out and looked at the tyre tracks we'd left across the pristine grass. Do you know the owners? I asked. No, should I? Well, I just thought it might be a bit odd for them to find some strangers pitching up in their garden. Like you pitching up in my garden, you mean? I realised she had me there. I could offer no reply. Dulcie unfolded a tartan picnic rug. Come on, she said. Help me with this. I didn't swim after our excursion in the Citroen. Instead, I spent the night with the verses of John Clare. Of all the poems that Dulcie had pressed upon me, his were the ones with which I felt the greatest affinity. Some of his work, those pieces that documented his wanderings down the lanes and across the fields of England, observing the seasons, working, pursuing freedom, was like a mirror held up to my own life. Until then, I hadn't realised that there existed such poets who laboured on the land and wrote down what they saw and felt and what they smelled and tasted and heard. This world of rabbit tracks and mole hills, hawthorn hedges and orchard floors, of nightingales and crooked stiles, was one that I too was experiencing. Claire was a new friend and confidant, a spirit guide, a voice of comfort in the lamplit shadows of my creaking shelter. And still every night I thought of the girls on the beach. My head whirled as I lay back and thought of their thighs and their flat stomachs. I wondered how their hair must smell when it was wet and whether they had tasted lobster and collected fossils or read John Clare. This preoccupation with the girls of the bay made me want to learn to write so that I could compose poems to all of them. Then perhaps they would fall for me entirely. I'd only just dozed off when I heard a noise, a moan of anguish. I lay still, searching for its origin in the flat and endless silence. And then there it was again, a muffled wail coming from the cottage. I pulled on my boots and went to the edge of the meadow and stood looking at the house. The night was cool and unmoving. Once more I heard it, a wail and then a sob, followed by the bulb of Dulcie's bedroom being switched on to cast flat panels of light across the garden. I ducked down, afraid of being spotted lurking. The light stayed on for several minutes, so I returned to my sleeping bag, my lower legs wet with dew, for one final reading of John Clare's The Flitting. She feels a love for little things that very few can feel beside, and still the grass eternal springs where castles stood and Grandia died. I drifted off in 1833 and slept for a century or more. The next day was still and dry, 
so I spent the morning working on the final task in the studio's restoration, painting the outside with a double coat of whitewash. Soon the transformation was nearly complete, the previously dejected-looking structure appearing to stand straight and true now, somehow prouder of itself, entirely fixed up and ready for habitation again. It was high summer now. Time became not a linear thing, but something more elastic. One minute expanding into a day, one week gone in the blink of an eye. Petals unfolded, willow blossom took to the breeze, and time itself was measured only by the clock of green growth and marked out by the simple routine of working, eating, swimming, sleeping. One night, when I returned from my evening swim, the outside table was set with a circle of candles of different heights and colours, their flames flickering in the gentle sea breeze of the settling evening. "'How is the water?' said Dulcie. "'Wet and wonderful.' I replied as I toweled the final dampness from my hair. I thought we could have kippers, she said. We'll also have one perfectly poached egg apiece, or perhaps two or more for you, as it seems that you've been busy. In return, I ask just one small favour. Of course, what is it? If the mood takes us later, perhaps you might read me one poem? Any poem? From the offing, she said. I hesitated. Well, yes, if you'd like me to, it'd be a privilege. Good. Now you should go and wash your hands. The kippers will be served in seven minutes or less. She scratched behind the dog's ears. Fish skin for afters, noble beast, she said to him. Your favourite. The light was fading rapidly. Fluttering moths tapped out paradiddle rhythms with their dry wings at the lamp that hung at the end of Dulcie's Lane. Should I get the poems now? I asked. Dulcie nodded. I'll fetch a bottle. There's a brandy I've been saving for an occasion, though I never imagined it would be for this. I fear I shall need it. She was lighting a very large cigar when I came back with the manuscript. She took short, sharp draws on it until it was fully ignited. Then she exhaled a long, heavy plume of thick smoke, followed by a small cough. She poured me two fingers of brandy. I didn't know you smoked, Dulcie. Only with poetry. I sat down. W which one would you like me to read? How can I choose when I don't know its contents, she said. Maybe I should pick one at random? I thumbed through the manuscript. I think this one's about you, I said. It's called The Honey Spinner. Oh. I proceeded to read it just as it was on the page. The Honey Spinner. Your breath comes across the pillow, a savannah breeze. Your mouth has produced no tumbleweeds while you were sleeping. The ravenous wolves have been cast from the kingdom of cruelty, and outside the first sweet drops of morning rain fall like a drunken violinist on the steps of the marble cenotaph. Dulcie said nothing for a long time. The cigar sat smouldering between her fingers. It hung there a ribbon of blue smoke drifting across the garden and into the meadow. I noticed then bats flitting across the grass, ducking and darting as they gorged on the evening's insects. Finally, Dulcie broke the silence. You know what you want to do? You want to get yourself a girlfriend. Her voice was elongated by the alcohol, and a slight slurring was making her words bleed into one another. When I didn't reply, she added, Oh, a boyfriend or one of each. Treat yourself. She circled her glass in the air and asked, Is there anyone back at home? Embarrassed, I shook my head. All the lasses round my weird daft. Again, she circled her glass, and this time brandy swirled around its rim and splashed onto her wrist. Then you need to cast your net further afield. The fisherman doesn't wait for the fish to jump out of the sea and into his boat. He goes out to the breeding grounds. Ah, I'm not really looking, I said. Dulcie looked at me sideways with the faintest of smiles. Not even a peek? Trying not to smile back, I shrugged. Maybe a, a glance. Of course you are. You're a young man full of blood and all the rest of it. When I was your age, I'd... 
she hesitated. Well, we'll not get into that. Now my interest was piqued. What had you done by my age, Dulcie? I scandalised the local vicar's daughter, that's what. I was thrown out of school for that. And th thank Christ I was, because if there's a hell on earth, then it's surely an English boarding school. What did you do? With Verity? No, after you were kicked out. I began to live, Robert, and to love too, and that's what you must do, live and love. And then, when you find someone who satisfies your soul too, you give yourself to them entirely. She poured us both another brandy. Pleasure is not a crime, she said. It's a birthright. Summer peaked. I spent days swimming and then exploring the cliffs above and the series of steep and narrow wooded vales that ran down to them. Or I wandered the smugglers' alleyways of the bay itself. I entertained few thoughts about leaving the place. Time stood still. The calendar had been tossed to the turning tides. It was summer and it felt as if it always would be. I would have bet good money against it ever ending. And after every evening meal, loose with the wine I was getting the taste for, or oiled by the brandy that Dulcie consumed as if it were water, a freshly snipped cigar held between her fingers, I read a single poem from the offing. With each reading I began to gain greater understanding of this woman that she had loved. Dulcie's responses to the pieces, meanwhile, varied wildly, from disquiet to excitement, visible grief to impassive silence, Yet the next night she was always ready to receive another, just the one, to be savoured. Or perhaps that was all her emotions would allow. Then one night, as the bats flitted for moths, and the bark of a fox was heard over the usual racket of owl hoots, mosquito drones and the faint sound of breaking waves, we reached the final page of Romy's manuscript. Suddenly it was nearly over. It's the last one, I said. Already? Yes. Are you sure? I held up the page. Quite sure. Dulcie poured us each an especially large brandy. Well then, we've come this far. We must proceed at all costs. I looked at the page. I'm a little stuck on the title of this one. It's in German. Read it out? I broke the word down and read it slowly. Überschwemmung, Todd. Dulcie smiled. Bless the Germans. They have a word for everything, and when they don't, they craft a hybrid on the spot. This is one of them. What does it mean? Überschwemmung would suggest flooding or submersion, or perhaps a deluge. And Todd is, of course, death. So roughly translated, it means flooding death or drowning. It's Romy's little joke from beyond. I frowned. Right. Oh, it's entirely in keeping with her humour, which was completely morbid and mordant too, said Dulcie. I found it one of her most attractive qualities, that and her elusiveness. It was becoming clear to me that Dulcie and Romy shared certain very similar character traits. Dulcie sighed slowly and deeply. I just wish I could have said goodbye. Please read it now, Robert. I did. Uberschwemmung, Todd. And now the animals are braying in the burning stable and scorched birds plummet from the sky. You no longer stoop to lift the gasping fish stranded, beached on the gravel bank. You are lost in the lie of your life now. Perhaps you were only ever a rumour of a person, a few good lines scratched across the page like fresh scars, a butterfly trapped in a childhood jam jar. So say farewell then in these dying days of April, a thin string of hollow words your worthless legacy, as you drop the final mask and make your mark on the map, sealed beneath rotting boards, a self all out at sea. As I completed the final line, the colour drained from Dulcie's face. What is it? I said. She's reaching out. I don't understand. Can't you see? She's reaching out. I knew she would eventually. 
She stood up. D did you pull up any floorboards while working on the studio? No, I replied, but I, I fixed one or two that were loose. Then you must show me where. But why? It's right there in the poem, Robert. Don't you see? She's reaching out to me from her, her watery grave, said Dulcie, excitement in her voice, sealed beneath rotting boards, a self, all out at sea. It's Romy's final farewell. I knew she would make contact in the end. I bloody knew it. In the shack, I pushed my blankets and sleeping bag aside and pointed to the floorboards. Do you mean these? Good Lord, Dulcie said. You can see just by looking. Fetch me a tool, will you? I found a chisel and Dulcie snatched it from my hands. Strands of hair fell in her face as she wedged the chisel between the boards, levering first one and then the other. Let me help you, I said. She ignored me, and with a sudden yanking motion, wrenched the floorboards clean upwards. And there it was. An envelope. With a trembling hand, she passed it to me. Neither of us said anything for a moment. Well, open it then, Dulcie urged. But it's yours. Open it. She hissed these words in such a manner that I could not refuse. I opened it. Read it. I began to read it. Out loud, Robert! So I did. April 1st, 1940. My dearest darling, Honey Spinner, if you have found this letter, then you are as wonderful and clever and brilliant as I know you to be. Well done. If you seek a reason, then it is this. I am exhausted beyond belief for I carry deep within me a thousand shadows that neither light nor laughter can possibly reach. My nation has wreaked unspeakable havoc, and it will happen again and again. Soon war will become all that we know, a constant state, until everything is raised. This world I see emerging is no place for a self-absorbed poet, especially one who has lost her voice. I am rendered helpless, useless, meaningless, of zero worth, I'm afraid I cannot atone for my premature departure. I just can't. But what I can apologise for is leaving you behind. You must know, my love, that it is only you who has made this existence tolerable these past years. I thank you for showing me this paradise, though we both know that in time, paradise too becomes corrupted. But you are strong, Dulcie Piper, a warrior queen. Know this. You will make it with or without me. I know you will. I thank you, thank you, thank you for doing your best. With love, I will leave now. Romy Landau. Beneath the letter, there was another sheet of paper. On it were typed four lines. I read these too. Fortified by laughter, galvanised by love. I am forever in your atoms. When I looked up, Dulcie was silently sobbing. Her shoulders shook, as if her body was finally expelling the grief that had been held tightly within since that April day over six years ago. I held the letter by my side. I was not yet emotionally equipped to deal with such a situation. Instead, I stood there in the sunlit studio unmoving, as compassionate as a piece of furniture. She dabbed first one eye on her cuff and then the other, then looked around. She appeared to stretch to full stature once more, and it was as if she were emerging from a deep and satisfying sleep. Well now, she smiled, I feel much better after that, much better indeed. She closed her eyes and recited the line she'd heard only once. Fortified by laughter, galvanised by love, I am forever in your atoms. She opened her eyes again. I think perhaps you were right all along, Robert. What about? 
Perhaps the world is ready for Romy's final work. Or perhaps you are ready too, I offered. Yes, she said quietly. That also. Do you mean you'll get it published? I'll try my damnedest, she said. I smiled. Oh, that's wonderful, Dulcie. There's just one thing. I, I should wish to hold back this one poem. She took the page from me and studied it for a moment. This one's for me and me alone. Perhaps it's selfish, but I must keep something of Romy back for myself. And you must keep these four lines a secret inside you forever. Hold them there. And I have. Until now. The breeze had changed direction and the air had an edge to it now. The summer was drawing to a close. I rolled up my sleeping bag and blankets and tied them into a tight bundle, then made a neat stack of the books that Dulcie had lent me. It was too chilly to breakfast outside, so we ate a simple meal of toast and jam in Dulcie's front room. We sat in silence, for there was little else to say. I cleared the cups and plates, and then, when there was nothing left to do, I stood awkwardly in the doorway for a moment. Thank you for letting me stay. You've taught me so much. No, Dulcie said. Anything you've learned, you've learned yourself. All I've done is point you towards it. Besides, you've more than earned your keep fixing this place up. And... She paused. Well, let's just say that you've brought more than one person back to life. We stood like this for a moment longer, and then I picked up my pack, turned and left the cottage. I walked down the lane that led to the future, the cooling sun at my back. I didn't go any further south. Instead, I turned north again, back towards the only place I knew. In September, I went to the pit. Yet instead of being handed a lamp and hard hat, my father had somehow wangled an apprenticeship for me in the office above ground. I was supposed to be grateful for a safe clerical position. But no one ever found adventure in ledger books and dockets. How could I sit indoors when all that life was out there, being lived by others? I thought of Dulcie often, and Romy too, as I tramped my way to work that winter, wondering at seventeen if this was adulthood and whether this was my life, my world, forever. Then one day in the spring... My mother took delivery of a flat parcel addressed to me. That evening, when I unwrapped it, I held in my hands a thin, ornately bound hardback book with an embossed cover. As I opened it, my heart quickened. There, facing the title page, was a frontispiece that depicted on it a finely detailed illustration of Dulcie's studio. Around it was the meadow, and in the far distance was the bay and the sea. There was even a dog lolling in the long grass. It was Butler. I turned the page and read the words The Offing by Romy Landau. And then, below that, in a smaller font, edited by Dulcie Piper and Robert Appleyard. She had done it. Dulcie Piper had done it. The Offing had arrived. An unexpected nervousness coursed through me as the lane dropped down into a shaded hollow. And there it was, Dulcie's cottage. And a moment later there was Butler, padding out to meet me in his quiet, graceful manner, to which I responded by giving him a big hug. And then there too was Dulcie Piper, in her garden just as I'd left her. She was pruning plants. Ah, she said, there you are. I suppose I should put the kettle on. Rose hip, all right? Rose hip, I replied. I was rather looking forward to some of your nettle tea. She made to spit. Ugh, vile stuff. It's nice to see you, Dulcie. It's nice to be back again. The studio appeared much as I'd left it. Apart from one small thing, attached to the door was a large wooden plaque into which was engraved the letter R. You named it after Romy. I said. And you? I was confused. Me? 
Of course. Here. She pressed the key into my palm. I slipped it into a new lock, opened the door and stepped into a fully furnished room. The place had been transformed with the addition of a wrought iron bed, a small drop-leaf table and a fitted shelf that ran right around the cabin's interior and which held hundreds of books. On the table was a large black typewriter. There's just one more thing. Dulcie placed an envelope in front of me. Your share of the offing so far does 50-50 on the royalty suit? I opened the envelope up and pulled out a cheque for £400. It was more than my father made in a year. I can't believe it, I said. The studio is in your name now, said Dulcie. I've written it into the deeds of the house, to stay in whenever you like. However, might I at least plant one seed of an idea? I was lost for words, almost. Of course, I said. University. She raised a hand. Now, hear me out. I remember what you said, clear as day. People like me don't go to places like that. Robert, that ripped at my heart. If you were to go to university, you would be refining what is already a keen mind. And perhaps one day, when you're wild success, you could repay the favour to someone equally as deserving. I wouldn't know where to start. I'll help you. But... What if I don't have the correct qualifications? She shook her head. Trust me, there are ways, special dispensations, scholarships. A bright boy like you can't fail to find a place somewhere. Believe in yourself, Robert, that's all it takes. I don't know what to say, thank you. You don't have to thank me. I smiled. I won't then, I'll retract it. But how did you know I was coming? Dulcie shrugged. Because the sap is rising and the ambrosia scent of summer is on the breeze again. I knew you'd be back one of these days. I remove my glasses, stand and stretch, then lean over to survey the words I have typed my wrists and knuckles aching. I'm not as fast as I used to be. Old age has spun cobwebs in all my joints, but at least my memory works. On certain days when I close my eyes and tune into nature's frequency, I'm 16 again. Each summer I returned, even when married with children, even after Dulcie Piper was long gone. Regimes rose and fell, and I kept coming back here to the meadow to write and read and think and watch badgers at dawn. Divorces and deaths and grandchildren occurred, and still I returned, always alone, until the stays became so prolonged I never left. With Dulcie at my shoulder urging me onwards to always do better, the books kept coming. Dulcie is here now, standing behind me, uncorking a bottle as she looks out across to the meadow, to the sea, to the offing. Sometimes I walk up to the little graveyard and sit by her headstone, amongst those of sailors and fishermen, and I know that soon enough I'll lie down and join them. That way of life has changed, of course. I walked along the beach early this morning, saw how much of the coast had eroded since my first view of it, it is a reminder that permanence is an impossibility. All is flux, and nature always wins. These are my last words, and I'll leave them here for you. <laughs> 